Welcome back to the Warcraft news, there is much to talk about. The return of four vanilla dungeons to the modern game, gearing updates for Season 3, the new Hallows End content, Blizzard updates, the merger, because yes, now we are all Microsoft gamers, and of course, a whole bunch more. And I want you to remember, the Turbulent Timeways event is right now on its penultimate week, so definitely make use of it for some easy leveling while you can. And of course, you can make use of store.bellular.games to, uh, yeah, you can pick up the art book for our first video game, the Pale Beyond, which is also on Steam. These are now in stock for rapid shipping. So, yeah, store.palliator.games, one of the best ways to support what we are doing. And with that said, let's go. Okay, let's talk about the merger then. So, I've seen some headlines going around, some YouTube videos, basically, I think it was mostly one from Stylosa, which um, I think is a very charitable, um, very hopium-like <laughs> take on what the uh, whole situation with Microsoft could mean, in his case, for like the battle pass and the business model of, um, of Overwatch. Now, there is actually some good news, and it seems they are re-looking at the battle pass earlier next year to make it uh, seem a bit better, but I think TLDR, um, I had my team look into it, the same team that does the research for our news channel, which we put content on every single day, and overall, I would not be full of hope that suddenly, like, business models will change, and some of those modern Blizzard frustration things, that, that those will go away. I've got a deep dive of the merger in the works for our news channel, and if you don't know, we do daily content there, so you can check that out. And um, But yeah, that's basically the situation. Now, what Phil Spencer did talk about in the interview that's been doing the rounds could be relevant to us, though, because he talked about legacy titles and IP, about launching them in a way that is basically not a cash grab and that is meaningful with love from the developers. And that certainly is a nice thing to hear him say. Of course, he is in the position of now owning Activision and Blizzard, and all of their legacy IP. So that means, of course, like the Lost Vikings and many other things. Also, the likes of, say, Warcraft 3. Now, compare the launch of Warcraft 3 Reforged to Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition. Now, there is a bit of hope here, because a few months ago, there was a uh, survey from Blizzard, right? And this survey basically included features of what a Warcraft 3 sort of soft relaunch would actually look like. It basically said it would have like ranked play, leaderboards, player profiles, clans, tournaments, and custom campaigns from like the original game, but also potential new reforged uh, features of a legacy Warcraft 3 in-game art update. That would be awesome, because let's be real, War 3 reforged, um, man, the art style, they, they just, I mean, let's be real, they missed it. Also, UI and UX revamp, so new menus, lobbies, chat, all of that, a storage size reduction, which would be very welcome, and reforged campaign improvements and reforged environment art reworks. So basically that sounds like it could go to be quite a lot of work. Um, so, War 3 Reforged, Blizzard have seemingly been thinking about it, they've at least been asking their audience. You then look at Microsoft, how they've treated legacy IP quite well, and that is, I think, pretty damn good. The final thing I will say is that there are some differences between third-party incentives and first-party incentives. As an example, if you're Sony and you've got God of War, The Last of Us, right, you want those to be absolute 10 out of 10 stunner games. You're not necessarily going to be thinking about how to maximally monetize the long tail of those games other than them just being really good, selling copies, and also being essentially system sellers, right? Whereas if you take a look over to, say, Bobby's World, we had the funny situation with the Spire Remix hitting like 10 million sales. That is a hell of a lot of sales, yet there doesn't seem to have been that much interest in properly doing Spyro content uh, beyond that, because what are they entirely focused on? Call of Duty and big live service titles. So, I do think that within the Microsoft umbrella, there could be a change to how projects are greenlit, and I think that some projects that would not have been greenlit under Activision Blizzard may be greenlit under Microsoft. Um, that basically is what I think from my analysis of the situation. All right, with that said, let's hop over to some in-game stuff where we've had quite a nice surprise, the return of the original Scarlet Monastery. Now, this may only be unlockable during Hallow's End because the item you need drops from the loot-filled pumpkins in the Headless Horseman boss encounter. But it's an account-wide unlock, so you've only got to do it once. And it's real easy, right? The Scarlet Key just drops from that pumpkin. You get the pumpkin when you kill the boss. It's also not account bound, so you can buy or uh, sell it on the auction house. There are only three and half grand on my server, and 
if they are only available during this period of time and seemingly have a pretty decent drop rate, um, what will happen if you maybe hoard them to sell them in six months time at a way higher price? I've got to wonder. But hey, don't take Warcraft stock tips from me. Now that item itself is a throwback to vanilla because back in vanilla, you would obtain the key from Arcanus Doan's uh, strongbox in the library wing, and then that would open the armory and the cathedral wings. Pretty neat. And to activate it, you just need to go into the non-instance part of the monastery. You'll see this keychain in the wall. You just need to interact with it, and then you'll get the Scarlet Key buff, and that buff will get you into the original versions of the Scarlet Dungeons. And if you're saying why, though, well, number one, it's cool. Number two, it is restoring legacy content to be, like, accessible within Warcraft, which is great. And number three, there's a whole bunch of previously unavailable transmogs in there. So, look, this ain't massive, but it is a really nice surprise, and I think between this, Skolomance, and Naxxramas, Blizzard have been showing a lot of love to Lordaeron. Lordaeron is a part of Warcraft that is crying out for more story, and the excellent Forsaken quest line of 1017 uh, kind of just made me, you know, hunger for more. Let's talk about our next patch then. So Blizzard's systemic tweaking is continuing with 10.2, actually getting a lot of really nice changes. Number one, the devs have announced that very rare gear drops from raids will now drop in addition to normal loot, rather than replacing one of the normal loot drops. That's uh, basically very nice. It'll be a whole other piece of loot, so it will feel, I suppose, more exciting. And overall, this is an increase to the amount of loot that you'll be getting from the raid. Now, our next change is also kind of interesting because patch 10.2 bosses will drop less tier. Here's a table of the drop ratios. You can see that it is a noticeable decrease, but I would definitely caution against being worried because this has got to be taken in context of other things. Number one, the revival catalyst is available from week one of season three. Last season, it was like week seven. And that means that by the time the catalyst would have been active per the old schedule, you'll already have been able to make like three bits of tier gear and you'll be almost able to make a fourth. And then since the catalyst uses regular gear drops to create tier, it actually increases the value of those regular gear drops and somewhat decreases the relative value of the tier tokens. So overall, basically, do not worry. The average player will get their two and four piece bonuses uh, like faster and more reliably, especially if you're a player who only plays Mythic Plus. That's not all though. The mastery achievement for getting Curve, Keystone Master, or I believe PvP 1600 uh, that uh, rewards you with a tier token at heroic difficulty, that is staying. And Farak will still be dropping an Omni token as Sarkareth did, which overall means that compared to previous seasons of World of Warcraft, you have got more control over how your character gets tier gear. Next then, the upgrade system changes. So if you played season two, like uh, I did, no doubt you would open your bags in your main character and you'd be swimming in like Whelpling or Drake crests, just stuffed into your agent bag. And you basically would be kind of frustrated because you had nothing to do but sell them for vendor gold while you probably also had some alts that, you know, really could have used them. Really annoying, right? Well, trading to alts is not coming, but trading crests upwards is coming. So if you've got too many Whelpling crests, don't worry, you can turn those into Drake crests. And what we now know is how this actually works. First up, each upgrade has got to be unlocked, and this is done by reaching a minimum item level in every slot of gear. These are eye levels 450, 463, and 476 for the upgrades to Drake, Worm, and Aspect Crests. Now, before I mention the trading values, you do need to remember something here. The notion of Crests and Crest Fragments from Season 2 is gone, right? So in the past, you would get 15 Fragments, and that would make a Crest and the crest will let you do one upgrade. Now, everything just drops crests. Crests don't go in your bag, they go into the currency tab, and upgrades cost 15 crests. So basically, that's all the same, but the currencies are more simplified, and it doesn't take up bag space, which is way better. So here's the values. It takes 90 of the weaker crest to make 15 of the stronger crest, right? So 90 Welpling crests would make 15 Drake Crests, and of course 15 Crests is what you need to do an upgrade. And it's kind of funny, this lets you do a bit of a fun calculation. You can work out how many Whelpling Crests is of equal value to an Aspect Crest, and the answer there is 36. Meaning that to get 15 Aspect Crests, what you would need for an upgrade, uh, if you were only converting with Whelpling Crests, it would cost you 540 of them. Uh, now, is that massively meaningful information? Not really. Is it kind of interesting? Yes, it is. I mean, I don't really know of any people who'll be upgrading their mythic raid gear using Whelpling crests, but hey, I wouldn't put it past them. Now, drop rates of crests, relatively speaking, are the same. So as an example, timing mythic plus dungeon will get you 12 crests. What is interesting here, though, is that the cap is actually lower. So 
The equivalent last season was 150 fragments per week. This time around, it's 90 fragments a week. That means the Blizzard are absolutely slowing things down. They're doing that in light of player feedback. I think more from their higher end community. But what that does also mean is like farming a stupid amount of Welpling crests. Like you won't be able to do that at the start because you'll rapidly hit the cap of those crests. So I think that this does safeguard against degenerate gameplay while just allowing players to make use of the excess resources they're generating on their characters. So overall, I think this is really good. It's not a humongous amount of upgrades but it will feel a lot better and Blizzard is just making it so that uh, you know your character is not generating dead weight that you can only like vendor for a few gold which feels bad and then remember this works in tandem with another systemic change if you are capped on one type of crest for the week but you do a piece of content that would normally award that type of crest, then it will just award the crest one level below. So if you're capped on, say, worm crests, and you do content that would usually drop worm crests, instead, that will drop drake crests until you're at the cap for the drake crests, in which case it would then drop whelpling crests. Overall, that's really good for people who, say, do a lot of Mythic Plus, or maybe do both Raid and Mythic Plus. Okay, final bit of gearing news. I know you're getting tired of it. Final bit. Crafted gear has been buffed by three item levels, making the best crafted gear in the game the equivalent of three out of four myth uh, upgrade track, which is only one level below the max level mythic Farak trinkets. Uh, they've all been increased in price, though, needing 15 more crests. That is more expensive, and of course you are capped to 90 crests a week, down from the Season 2 equivalent of 150, which does somewhat slow down the pace of gearing. Uh, overall, though, I think that is broadly fine in light of how Season 2 felt and a bunch of uh, the player feedback there. Overall, it does actually seem to be looking pretty healthy and sustainable. Okay, let's talk business. There is a Halloween store bundle and a refresh of the 12-month subscription bundle. It is no cheaper per month than the six-month sub bundle, but it does give you a purple recolor of the last 12-month mount, the current six-month mount, and uh, what looks like a night elf armored owl bear and perhaps an Amir Drasil Slither Drake skin. Uh, Maché, I mean, looks uh, cool, I, I guess. Um, there is a Wrath Classic Drake as well, and um, a little box of loot in the graphic. I don't know what that does. To be honest with you, my main surprise here is they haven't thrown Trader's Tender in. Like, there's no Trader's Tender here, and there's no Trader's Tender on the BlizzCon, like, virtual... Well, it's not called the virtual ticket anymore, but that bundle anyway, um, which I did think was kind of fascinating. I, I expected them to do that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I still think they'll do it in the future, but I suppose it's nice that they've not fully hit the accelerator on the monetization of Trader's Tender via bundles and things. All right, let's talk Hallow's End. So it's been updated. There's a hard mode for the Headless Horseman that's actually really cool. There's a quest line for the Horseman, the Hallow's End Dragon Riding Saddle, the Candy Bucket offhand, the Arphus Pet, and of course now there are Candy Buckets across the Dragon Isles, and also the Scarlet Monastery stuff that I mentioned earlier. This is also a really easy source of 650 Traveler's Log points, so you can almost finish out your month. I'll start off with the hard mode then. So you activate the hard mode by interacting with the Wicker Man at the dungeon entrance. There are small Wicker Men, that give you one curse, and there's a big one that gives you all four curses. What do I mean curse? Well, this curse is called Wicker Man's Shadow, and it will reduce your max health by 10%, stacks up to 10 times. Now, you get these curses by basically taking avoidable damage from the mechanics activated by the Wicker Men. These include thorns to avoid, shackled souls to kill before they reach a fire, hallucinations to move to, and AoEs to avoid. So if you fail those mechanics, you'll get more stacks of the buff. If you hit 10 stacks, rather than die, you'll actually get a buff called Wicker Man's Protection, which will remove the curses and prevent you from dying, but you will of course lose your hard mode rewards. And the way these rewards work are that for every curse that you survive, there is a greater chance of rare loot from the loot-filled pumpkin. This includes, of course, the Horseman Mount, Arphis, uh, the Hallow's End Saddle, and potentially those Scarlet Keys. And 100 Traveler's Log points. That's what you get for defeating the boss with all four of the curses up. You'll also get 100 points from defeating the boss five times. You'll get 250 points for completing a total of six daily quests, 50 from Bobbing Apples, and 150 for visiting five candy buckets in Pandaria, five in the Dragon Isles, and five with War Mode turned on, which basically means you can almost complete your log in like barely any time. And also, little thing that you may not know, be sure to visit the Hag of the Crooked Tree in Val Sharab because she's got a daily quest that has a chance of dropping these pretty neat looking cosmetic hats. 
And really that's it for the core news. The new patch is marked as a release candidate, which uh, basically means it's essentially ready to go. And as we know, it will be shipping on the 7th of November with the week after that, the new season starting. And of course, LFR rolling out over uh, the coming weeks after that. That essentially is where things are. I don't anticipate there will be a humongous amount more to talk about. That being said, uh, it does mean that at BlizzCon, we're probably going to learn a fair bit about where this raid's going. We're gonna learn about the 2024 roadmap. And with us having a release candidate build in the PTR, like actually quite a good amount of time before the patch comes out, yeah, I mean, this will obviously need some bug testing, but I totally imagine Blizzard will be able to put whatever comes next on the PTR pretty damn quickly after BlizzCon, because yes, this content pace is absolutely relentless. And I think the main thing that we all want to know is, will 10.2 be the end? I think it will be. That being said, if 10.2 is the final big raid tier, what happens with Eridicron? And what is our content going to look like in 2024? Are we going to get a 0.5 and a 0.7? Are we going to get a season four that's greatest hits? Or are they going to change things up a little bit? I mean, as an example, I saw some uh, some teases, right, of um, archaeology being something that they may be revamping. Um, obviously, that hasn't came to pass thus far. Could we get the archaeology revamp? Ian Hasakostas also, I believe in an interview with me, teased them, them wanting to do a bit more with outdoor time walking content. So again, is that something we could see in the sort of post 10.2 period? Another thing is perhaps a revamped Brawler Guild. As an example, in I think 10.1.7 and 10.2 data mining, we've seen loads of NPCs that just totally look like Brawler's Guild NPCs. And also, I believe in an interview, some Blizzard people said that like when they bring the Brawler's Guild back, it will be back as a proper evergreen feature. And it's like, well, they're talking about it, and we do just have this gap of time. It does sort of make sense that the Brawler's Guild would make it in there. In which case, would that be the piece of Mage Tower-like content that they said they really wanted to do within Dragonflight? Or could we expect that as, uh, as perhaps another thing? That's really what's in the future. And as for the lore Q&A that I know has been doing the rounds, I've actually already recorded a video on that. It came out really long, way too long for the WoW news. So we're cutting that down and uh, it will probably have been out before this video. So you can check that out next. With that said, thank you for tuning in. Enjoy Hallow's End and I'll see you next time.